basically pull my Wendy's Frosty out of our big freezer. We had one of these, you know, box-like freezers. And for the next six hours, I would sit in front of the television uh, from 8.30 to about 2.30. 2.30 was right around when the, the cartoons ended and all this really bad programming came on. Uh, so 8.30 to 2.30, I'd sit in front of the television and I'd finish from top to bottom my Wendy's Frosty. I mentioned my older brother, Jonathan. Well, there are times when my parents had to leave the house, and uh, he was a good older brother and would cook us uh, dinner. And I have strong memories of our dinner, which was Pillsbury croissants. I remember distinctly putting the aluminum foil and rolling, you know, they came in triangles for any of you who have them, and you roll them up. Uh, and we would, we would go through about two, two of these rolls, and he would make for me cash. Orange Julius, so the, the, the ice chalet, and uh, every time before going ice skating, we'd stop at Orange Julius, and I would get a big Orange Julius to go with my corn dog. And I found out, I mean, what basically what's in Orange Julius, I just looked it up the other day. Uh, all I knew that back then was that it tasted really good. But it's basically like cream, orange juice, and sugar. <laughs> and that's what it's composed of. And then last, banana splits. So my parents grew up in Singapore, and when we were young, we would, all my dad's side of the family still lived in Singapore. So we would go back every summer, and I just remember like one or two summers where I was in a banana split phase of my life. And so all, I, had five, I had five aunts and uncles, uh, and then their stock, so ten aunts and uncles, all conspiring to find me the best banana split. And we would go to restaurant after restaurant, and I would taste and decide which one was the best banana split. So, clearly, the standard American diet is as standard as it gets. Fortunately, I did grow, eventually grow out of it. I developed a strong interest in nutrition. I remember sitting on the ground of, I don't even know if it exists, but it was called Crown Books back then. And I'd sit on the ground sort of reading books on nutrition. And it really is out of that period of my life that I developed a lifelong interest. Um, and so it's no surprise then that when the 80s came, uh, 80s, 90s, what was the major dietary fad that happened? Yeah, low fat. Low fat, fat free, right? Oh my gosh, I remember this. All, I became obsessed. All I cared about was this number, total fat. And as long as it was zero grams, I was um, happy. And so what that meant is that now my favorite foods, uh, so in this paradigm, right, sugar is fine. There's no problem with sugar. You can eat as much sugar as you want because that's not what makes you fat or gives you any problems. So some of my favorite fat-free foods, snack was, Antonin's was the top of the list. Because I remember you had Antonin's, uh, like the chocolate loaf pie, uh, you had all sorts of cookies, chocolate chip, oatmeal cookies, and they were all fat free. And so if they're fat free, they're free. You could eat as much as you want. Fig Newtons, I would go through uh, a whole, not, not quite a whole carton, but a whole half of a carton in a single sitting. Um, I changed from Wendy's Frosties to you know, fat free ice cream and all the fat free frozen yogurts. Twizzlers. Uh, strong, again, strong memories. You know, my brother and I, we would, we'd get the supersized Twizzler bag and we would just plow through those. We'd sneak them into the feet theaters because we didn't want to pay the exorbitant price. And we would we'd go through the whole bag in a single city. And then last, we chased everything down with orange juice, gross skin orange juice in particular. And uh, I remember getting, like, going through the grocery store and getting three, four of those 96 ounce cartons and drinking it like it was water. Again, really under this paradigm that this is completely free. Uh, that I'm actually, I'm actually being healthy by eating this. And I think now we all look at this and kind of laugh, but I guarantee you back then, a lot of us were doing this and really thinking like, oh my gosh, as long as that total gram is at zero, we're fine. So uh, just briefly, my sugar phase, uh, went through, uh, eventually ended, and then what's the biggest rage in recent years? Paleo, right? So uh, my nutritional history would be 
complete if I didn't go through the paleo uh, period. And just to cut a long story short, I, would, I, I did low carb for a number of years, and I'm embarrassed to say I did it actually during residency, during my medical residency, and I was actually advocating this for some of my patients. Uh, and it really reached its peak with this, in and out uh, One time I went to in and out and there was an off-menu item. It's actually not on the menu. You have to, you have to be in the know. Uh, and their menu is called, their off-menu item is called a protein-style burger. So it's a burger essentially wrapped in lettuce, all right, instead of the buns. Because God forbid you would eat any carbohydrates. <laughs> and I remember eating. I, I got a double, a double protein-style burger. And at the end of it, again, under this really naive way of thinking that this is free, this is the equivalent of a bag of Twizzlers in the sugar, in the fat free air, why not have another one? So I remember that night, I ate two, not just one, but two of these. And just out of curiosity, I looked up what nutritional content I ate. In that one meal, I had 78 grams of fat, 240 milligrams of cholesterol, and basically 100% of my recommended daily amounts of salt. And again, I was smug. I remember eating those and being smug and thought, wow, I'm, I really ate a healthy meal there. So fortunately, I, clearly, I wouldn't be here today if I was still in my paleo phase, right? I did have my aha moment, and it actually only came two years ago. Uh, my son was actually at the Chinese American International School doing Chinese summer school. And as a result, my wife, I have, a, I have an eight-year-old son and a four-year-old daughter. This was two years ago, so they were six and, and two. Um, my, my son was staying with my mother-in-law, and uh, my wife, we would kind of carpool back and forth, so she would be in San Francisco staying with her mom uh, for some days of the week, and then when she had to come back and work, then she would come up back to Santa Rosa, which is where we live, and I would go back to San Francisco. Uh, and so as a result, when they were all down, because my wife would take my daughter Julie, I had more time on my hands, and so I don't normally watch much television, but it happened that on a, on a on a Thursday, I was watching television and I came on to PBS. And who would appear on the screen but Dr. Joel Furman? Okay. Um, many of you are probably very familiar with his uh, amazing work and what a pioneer he is in the, the plant based field. I'll never forget that day because he said four words that I had never heard before despite four years of medical school. I went to Boston University and three years of residency at Santa Rosa, which is an outstanding program. I highly recommend it for all potential candidates. I had never heard these four words. Whole food, plant-based. I heard paleo, low carb, vegan, vegetarian, uh, but I had never heard whole food, plant-based. And I remember watching him make these outrageous claims about the power of a whole food, plant-based diet to not just prevent, but actually reverse chronic illnesses such as high blood pressure, diabetes, coronary artery disease, autoimmune disease. And I had never heard anyone make such outlandish claims. But when I looked at what he was really peddling, it was beautiful colored fruits, vegetables, legumes, greens. And so I, I felt like I owed it to myself to investigate further. So the very next day was my turn to come down to San Francisco. So Jean, my daughter, they came up to Santa Rosa. I came down and I picked up Joshua and I said, Joshua, we're going to the San Francisco Public Library. And so we checked out his books first and then I said, now it's Daddy's turn. And we went up to the sixth floor. I think it was the sixth floor. And uh, I checked out uh, Eat to Live, and, which was a book written by uh, Joel Furman, really probably his best selling book. And I checked out Eat to Live and read all about plant-based eating. And then that same day, I watched Forks Over Knives. Uh, and then right around 2 a.m., I would watch Fat, Sick, and Nearly Dead. Uh, and but basically, by about 4 a.m. on that day in uh, July of 2014, I officially became a convert to a whole food plant-based way of eating. And I have not looked back since. It has only, each day, each study, each patient I come across only further reinforces my conviction that this is the healthiest way for all of us to be eating. Um, and what is basic? I mean, you know, I'm not going to assume, even though we're at a bench test, that everyone knows what I mean by whole food plant based. Basically, think of four food groups, right? So, first food group, fruits. Uh, second food group, 
vegetables. Third food group, lentil uh, legumes, so you know beans, peas, lentils. And then the last last uh, food group, grains. And if you put this, oh, I just noticed there's some sunflower seeds in there with a small amount of nuts. And you put this all together, that's a whole food plant based way of eating. Um, and you notice that these are things in as natural a state as possible. It doesn't necessarily mean raw, but it just means uh, as minimally processed. Um, since doing this, my professional career has changed significantly. Um, I have I have um, now, as, uh, as the person mentioned earlier, I am now in three settings. So I work at Kaiser Permanente, and I work part-time in the family medicine department and teach their plant-based eating class, which meets once a month. Uh, and I'm really proud to admit, or to tell you, that it's the number one subscribed class in all of Kaiser Santa Rosa, if we have anywhere from yeah. Which really shows the huge growing interest in this. We have anywhere from 40 to 60 people uh, come out every month. And we have uh, distinguished speakers. We, um, we recently had Dr. McDougall will come and come and give a lecture. And uh, so, part-time at Kaiser, I'm the medical director of the Mc, uh, McDougall program. And uh, that's a residential program for people 8 to 10 days coming from all around the nation, uh, in some cases all around the world, uh, for lectures, um, medical care and meals uh, in uh, eating a plant-based way with a particular emphasis on starches in the McDougal program. And then last, I'm a, a staff physician at True North, which is also based in Santa Rosa. Um, True North is interesting because they do uh, not, not only a focus on plant-based eating, but they emphasize no salt, oil, sugar. Um, they also do uh, juice fasts as well as water fasts. And the growing evidence for the power of uh, water fasting for addressing chronic illness is growing by the day. Uh, recently, there was just a publication in British Medical Journal, which is one of the most prestigious journals around, of a case study of a, a woman with lymphoma, uh, grade, a stage three lymphoma, who came to True North and stayed and did a 21-day water fast. And then at the end of it, her lymphoma had essentially regressed and they have uh, pre and post MRI images. So that's a really exciting field. So I love working in all three of these settings, but it's all really tied together by a food plant-based uh, diet or lifestyle. Well, sugar reared its ugly head again. Uh, and this time, it reared its ugly head in my patients. What I began to notice is that there were many patients of mine who completely understood the concepts behind a plant-based way of eating. And yet, uh, they struggle to overcome their uh, attraction to sugar. And I'll give you two examples. One of them was a uh, woman who had been to True North eight times. And every time she came, she did wonderfully. Uh, you know, she, she lost weight, she went to the lectures, she learned all the, the principles, she went to the cooking classes. And uh, when I saw her, I said, what's going to be What's going to be different this time? What, you know, what, what is it that is your that causes you to sort of uh, regress or fall, uh, fall down, so to speak, when you leave here? And she said, you know, Doc, it's sugar. Uh, and I was like, well, what does that look like? And she said, well, Toblerone, for example, I absolutely love Toblerone. And you know, not the small Toblerones, but the big Toblerones with the big triangle. It's like I will eat an entire Toblerone in one city. And I, I, I couldn't get my head around that because honestly right now if you offered me one of those triangles, I, it, it would just be like extremely rich uh, and sweet for me. And yet she could go through an entire big tour in a single city. And so when I got my head around that, it, it didn't surprise me that she was back at Trudeau for the eighth day of the time. Uh, but it got me started thinking about sugar. Uh, another patient of mine, went through the McDougal program and is, uh, is a psychologist, or a therapist actually, uh, MFT, Marriage and Family uh, Therapist. And she, again, clearly knew the principles behind plant-based eating. Um, and after the program, she was doing well for a couple months and then eventually uh, she had some uh, difficulties. And, 
again, I kind of went through that same thing. Where can we focus our attention? And again, for her, it was sugar. And she told me that she would drink an entire two-liter two -liter bottle of Sprite. Not necessarily in one sitting, but over the course of a day. Um, and just to give you an idea, so a Sprite, a, a two-liter Sprite bottle has six servings, 12 fluid ounces, 140 calories. That amounts to 228 grams of sugar in a single day. In case you have difficulty picturing it, this is how many teaspoons of sugar are in a two-liter bottle. 57 teaspoons of sugar. And she, you know, she would drink this by herself in the course of a single day. Now what's interesting, just to really emphasize that these are people who completely get plant-based eating, this is samples from her food bottle. Breakfast, oatmeal with blueberries and slivered almonds. Lunch, two small corn tortillas baked crisp, topped with water sauteed mushroom, onion, red pepper, avocado. Dinner, steamed sliced potatoes, mushrooms with peas, carrots, green beans. Right? Clearly, she gets plant-based eating, and yet she's drinking a two-liter bottle of Sprite in a single sitting. And when we take it, you know, I'm not just giving some isolated stories of one patient here, one patient there. Let's look at what's happened over time. The amount of sugar we consume each year has increased dramatically. So in 1776, right, the American Revolution, on average, about four pounds of sugar per person per year. 1850, five times that, 20 pounds. 1994, 120 pounds of sugar. And then this is most alarming of all, present day, 160 pounds. I weigh 145 pounds. So you basically the average American is eating more than my weight, 15 pounds more than my weight in sugar per year. It's astounding. So clearly, it's not just my, my patients, I, we as a country, and I would argue as a world, have a problem when it comes to sugar. Oh, and just to add to that, what one major driver of this increase is soft drinks, right? The consumption of soft drinks is, uh, has increased by five-fold since 1950. So I really have three objectives today. Um, number one, I really want you to walk away with an appreciation for the health implications of sugar. Is sugar just empty calories? Because if that's all, then, you know, fat and obesity should really be the only thing we're worried about. But I, I'm going to argue that there's many more health implications uh, from too much sugar. Number two is talk about sugar's addictive qualities, okay? And then last, to, you know, end on a positive note, how can we address this problem? And how can we help ourselves or help others around us to uh, have a more healthy relationship when it comes to sugar? It's really important to clarify that when we talk about sugar, at least when I'm talking about sugar in this presentation, I am not referring to this sugar in, say, fruits and vegetables. Um, these sugars are completely, completely different. They're naturally occurring. They're part of a whole food, plant-based diet. Uh, when you bind them with the protein, the fiber, the water content, uh, it's a completely, completely different thing. And your body metabolizes and processes it differently. Your blood sugar levels don't rise as much. So. Uh, all the sugar that's in this is healthy sugar, right? It's natural whole sugar in its natural form. What we're talking about is the added sugar. And one of the tr tricky things when it comes to added sugar is just how many forms this can come in. So it's disguised under many names, right? And I just put in red some of the ones we more we know more, more commonly. So agave nectar, brown sugar, evaporated cane juice, Fruit juice concentrate, high fructose corn syrup, honey, maple syrup, uh, granulated sugar, right? All of these do fall under my uh, rubric for added sugar, okay? None of these uh, are in their, um, coming in their natural form with the food intact. Now, as, um, as mentioned earlier, I am a lawyer. I'm licensed in California. I took the bar exam. And so one of the... Uh, one of the things you learn to do as a lawyer is to look at all sides of an issue, right? So, I want to look at the good in sugar. I don't, I don't just want to bad mouth sugar as if it's this evil thing in and of itself. Let's look at some of the virtues of sugar. Let's start off with that. 
So sugar, the good. Number one, and probably most important, added sugar absolutely can enjoy, uh, enhance one's enjoyment of eating. Uh, at the McDougall program, we serve pancakes, and no, no animal products in the pancakes, no milk, uh, no butter. Um, but we do serve pancakes, and um, at the McDougall program, there's, there is maple syrup for the patients to, to use. And Dr. McDougall's thought is that it, it, for a plant-based diet to be sustainable, uh, that people will oftentimes need to add a little bit of sugar to certain things just to make it more enjoyable. Um, you know, uh, some people add honey or agave to their tea. To their tea. Uh, it makes it um, uh, more enjoyable as well. Or sprinkle a little bit of sugar on one's grapefruit. And I thought it was interesting. This was a uh, consensus statement from the American Heart Association in the journal Circulation. And even they recognize that sugar uh, it, it adds enjoyment. And here's their quote. Sugars add desirable sensory effects to many foods. And a sweet taste promotes enjoyment of meals and snacks. Okay. Number two, sugar can be a powerful medical treatment in certain cases. Um, I remember during a res medical residency that when we needed to do procedures on um, babies, such as a circumcision, we would oftentimes give them a sugar sucrose solution. And that would help calm them and pacify them and, uh, and make it so that the, you know, whatever procedure we were doing, uh, was uh, uh, possibly less traumatic for them. Um, you know, Mary Poppins, right? A spoonful of sugar makes the medicine go down. And um, I think for any of us who are parents, we have probably at one time or another given uh, our kid some sort of cough syrup or something that had sugar in it, and it certainly made it so that our kids were able to get the medicine uh, into their system. And then last, it can really be life-saving. So one of the most dangerous things with diabetes uh, is, is not so much the high blood sugars. High blood sugars is a problem when you're talking about chronic over years, leading to kidney damage, eye damage, um, uh, uh, neuropathy, so nerve damage at your feet. But in the acute, day by day, what your biggest fear of is that patients who are taking insulin become super hypoglycemic because they can actually die from hypoglycemia. Or if they're driving and they have a hypoglycemic reaction, they can get into a car accident. So we always, always, always tell any of our diabetic patients who are taking any medication that lowers their blood sugar to have a quick source of sugar on hand. Whether it's a glass of orange juice, whether it's these uh, glucose tablets, um, whether it's even a piece of candy, just something that will get the sugar in and get it quick. You know, it's, it, when, when I have a patient with diabetes who's hypoglycemic, that is not the time that I want them to eat a baked potato, okay? That's when I want them to eat pure sugar. And then last, um, sugar is a really important uh, uh, source of energy in sports, performance, and recovery. And especially when we're talking about extended uh, sports, like, you know, uh, like running a marathon. Uh, I, I ran the Boston Marathon in, uh, in early 2000. And I remember throughout that race, I was just, I, I wanted quick sources of sugar. Okay? And if I didn't get those quick sources, I probably would not have been able to complete the race. So critical for sports performance and recovery. And I think that about kind of sums up the virtues of sugar. I mean, you know, they're, they, they're, there are reasons, they are very reasonable, but I don't, I can't really think of any others. Is any, anyone else in the audience, am I missing anything? Okay. So we've done a fair job, right? We've, we've covered the virtues of sugar. Let's talk about the bad. Like I said, the prevailing thought in America is that if you have too much sugar, that's excess calories, and that's what's driving um, uh, some of us to be overweight, to obese. But as Dr. Laura Schmidt, just right around the corner, UCSF professor of health policy, points out in an article, editorial she wrote, too much sugar does not just make us fat. It can also make us sick. And so let's take uh, uh, something called metabolic syndrome. Okay? And let's kind of look at this one by one and, and, and see what we, sense we can make of it. So metabolic syndrome, you have metabolic syndrome if you have three or more of five traits. Okay? Now, the reason we care about metabolic syndrome is that it is a huge um, uh, 
risk factor for cardiovascular disease, uh, heart attack, stroke, uh, diabetes. All right. Um, so five traits. Number one is is what we call central obesity, and they they call it apple versus pear shaped. Um, and so for men, if your waist size, if your pants you wear is 40 inches or more, or for a woman, if you're 35 inches or more, then you meet criteria for what's called central adiposity or central obesity. Okay, so that's that's number one. Number two, uh, markers of insulin resistance. And the primary way we look at this is what's your fasting blood sugar. Now, the cutoff for di di diabetes diagnosis is 126 milligrams per deciliter or higher. But once you get 100 milligrams per deciliter or higher, that's already a sign of insulin resistance. So that's the criteria we use for that. High blood pressure, all right? So if formal criteria for hypertension is 140 over 90. But once you get over one, uh, let's see, is it one, I always forget, one, yeah, 130. So once your systolic blood pressure is 130 or higher, or your diastolic blood pressure, which is the bottom number, is 85 or higher, then you meet the criteria for um, elevated blood pressure. Uh, and then last two markers for cholesterol. So one is triglycerides, if your triglycerides are 150 or higher, um, or HDL for men, if your HDL is 40 or lower, or for women, uh, lower than 50, okay? You meet three out of five of these and you have metabolic season. I wanted to show a picture just to kind of give you an idea. So some people carry their fat in their belly, right? And it's shown that this is more dangerous because this is called visceral fat. It's fat surrounding your organs such as your pancreas and your liver um, and leads to more health problems than fat that is sort of in the hair shape, so carried by your hips or your buttocks. And here's just kind of it in picture form, right? So you would Look at these two. These two people would probably most likely meet criteria for central adiposity, um, and she probably would not, even though she does carry a lot of weight below the waist. So, why do we care about met metabolic syndrome? Thirty-five percent. That is the percentage of all U.S. adults estimated to have metabolic syndrome in a study conducted in 2012. One out of every three, more than one out of every three people, because I only see adults here, one, more than one out of every three people in this room have a metabolic syndrome. When you look at people who are 60 years or older, it increases to 50%. One out of every two people in the United States who is over 60 years old has metabolic syndrome. And now, hopefully after I've, we've gone through each of those, that means something. I mean, metabolic syndrome is a cluster of things that shows your highly increased risk for um, heart attack and stroke. So what does sugar have to do with metabolic syndrome? Well, this was a study of U.S. adolescents, okay? Um, and the objective of the study, they looked at over 1,600 adolescents. And the goal was to examine the association between added sugar intake and metabolic syndrome. Uh, participants were divided into quintiles, so you had the uh, 0 to 20 percent, 20 to 40 percent, 40 to 60 percent, etc. So five quintiles in terms of how much added sugar they took in. What they found is that adolescents who consumed the most sugar were anywhere from five to ten times more likely to have metabolic syndrome than those who consumed the least. Five to ten times. When we look at each of these components, in and of themselves, right? That, US, that study looked at adolescence and metabolic syndrome as a whole. But when we break it down and look at, say, blood pressure and cholesterol, this was a systematic review. Uh, it's called a meta-analysis. So a meta-analysis is a study that looks at a whole, all the studies that have been done, all right? So it's not an actual study. It's sort of a review of everything that's been done out there. And in this meta-analysis of 39 uh, studies, they uh, had this to say as their conclusion. This systematic review provides evidence that higher compared with lower intakes of sugars are associated with increased concentrations of triglycerides, total and LDL cholesterol, and blood pressure. And I want to emphasize that these were independent of sugar's effect on body weight. Okay? So it wasn't that um, they, just because they, were, they gained more weight and then that was why they had increased uh, cholesterol or increased blood pressure. They adjusted for that, so they looked at just the, the impact.
that, I'm sure. And I'm not going to get in detail I, I, uh, about this, but I just wanted to show poten the potential mechanisms by which uh, uh, added sugar, and specifically fructose, can contribute to something like high blood pressure. And you know, here we see elevated levels of insulin, um, elevated uh, levels of uh, leptin, uh, and all at the end of the day, they lead to various physiologic uh, uh, mechanisms in the body that drive up your blood pressure. And uh, this was uh, this article uh, written in uh, journal Open Heart went so far as to argue that added sugars probably matter more than dietary sodium for hypertension. Because what's one of the first things your doctor always tells you when you have a new diagnosis of high blood pressure? All right, decrease your salt intake. Um, and here they're arguing that in, in, based on the evidence, they actually feel like it matters, that added sugar matters more than dietary salt. Okay, so we've looked at blood pressure, cholesterol, um, and then uh, last, let's look at insulin resistance. And let's go so far as to look at sugar's relationship with diabetes. So Mayo Clinic, right, very prestigious clinic, they put, they put out articles in what's called Mayo Clinic Proceedings. Um, and they did one on diabetes and said that at current levels, sugar consumption and fructose consumption in particular, in concentrations and contexts not seen in natural whole foods, are fueling a worsening epidemic of type 2 diabetes. Uh, and notice again, I want to make sure that we walk away not confused. It's not because of sugar's impact on making us heavier, and then that's what's driving it. These added, added sugar and high fructose corn syrup elevate our risk of diabetes independent of their effect on weight. And what's interesting is that in, they looked at studies on animals and humans, and if you took uh, isochloric replacement, so what that means is that if you took, let's say, 500 calories uh, in an animal model or human diet that were, let's say, potatoes or sweet potatoes, so some complex carb and starch, and replaced it with just simple sugar, sucrose or fructose, that that would worsen markers of diabetes, such as fasting blood sugar, uh, your level of insulin in your body, um, your insulin sensitivity. So, same amount of carbs, right, but just the form that they come in, having greatly different impacts on your, on your body's physiology. And then last, this was a, uh, a study that looked at um, over 10,000 uh, participants in Europe, um, and they basically wanted to show, look at the relationship between sugar sweetened beverages and diabetes. And what they found is that one 12 ounce soft drink per day was associated with an 18% increase in your risk for diabetes. So, whether it's with insulin resistance or diabetes, high blood pressure, cholesterol, um, added sugar affects every single marker of metabolic syndrome. But let's, let's bring it back to basics. Why, again, do we care about metabolic syndrome so much? Why is this such a big deal? Well, because metabolic syndrome increases your risk for cardiovascular disease, right? And cardiovascular disease is the number one cause of death worldwide. 17 million people in the world die every year because of cardiovascular disease, heart attack, stroke. It averages out in the U.S. to one person every 40 seconds. So during this 60, uh, 60 minute talk, give or take, uh, we're going to have 90 people on average die from cardiovascular disease. It's a, it's a, it's a global uh, epidemic. And what's crazy about this is that it's virtually completely preventable. Okay? Cardiovascular disease, if you're leading the right lifestyle by not smoking, getting exercise, and eating a predominantly plant-based diet, it's entirely preventable. So there was a study that came out in 2014 that actually lo looked at added sugar and what we care about most, cardiovascular uh, diseases and mortality. And it examined the association of added sugar intake with cardiovascular disease mortality over a 20-year period. So they got a lot of really good data. And this was what they found. People who consumed 25% or more of their daily calories from added sugar 
were almost three times, almost three times more likely to die from cardiovascular disease than people consuming less than 10% of their daily calories from sugar. And again, these figures are adjusted for things like age, sex, uh, race, body mass index, smoking status, um, physical activity level. They took all those variables out of the equation. And even taking all of those out, just the pure addition of added sugar um, put them at a three times increased likelihood of dying from cardiovascular disease. Another mark of cardiovascular disease is stroke, right? Essentially, you know, you can think of stroke and heart attack as uh, just different ends of the same process. At the end of the day, it shows that your vessels are diseased. Um, you know, you can even go so far as to say, for example, erectile dysfunction. A lot of people call erectile dysfunction the canary in the coal mine because we see people in their 20s, 30s developing erectile dysfunction now. What that is saying is that you have compromised blood flow to your penis. And that's, what, that's why we're seeing young people have difficulty obtaining interaction. So in some ways, it's a blessing in disguise because now they know, like, okay, I really have to change my diet. And um, they're given sort of a sentinel warning uh, way ahead of time. So stroke. Uh, this study looked at sugar sweetened beverage consumption and its association with the risk of stroke. There was a large Swedish study that followed 68,000 healthy people. And these were healthy people as defined by no cardiovascular disease, uh, no cancer, no diabetes. Uh, and they ranged between 45 to 83. What they found is people who drank 12 ounces, so 12 ounces is just one can of Coke, okay, one, one can of Sprite, who drank 12 ounces or more sweetened beverages per day were 22% more likely to suffer a stroke than those who drank less than three ounces per day. So let's move on a little bit. I, I hope I've convinced you with study after study on 60, 70, 80,000 patients of the association of added sugar with um, cardiovascular disease and metabolic syndrome. But there's a lot of talk about sugar and its relationship with inflammation as well. And one of the cardinal, uh, or one of the, the diseases that we most associate with inflammation is rheumatoid arthritis. So I'm not going to dive into deep, deep detail, but I at least wanted to show you one study. 63%, um, this was a 20-year study that followed over 150,000 women. And what they found is that women who consumed one or more sugar sweet beverages per day, uh, usually sodas, had a 63% increased risk of developing rheumatoid arthritis compared to women who were drinking no uh, sugar sweet sodas or less than one. 63%. And what's even more interesting is when they looked at older, when they took out the younger woman who developed it, and they just looked at older women, that percentage increased to 250%. So two and a half times the likelihood of developing rheumatoid arthritis just by having a 12 ounce uh, Coke or Sprite per day. And then the last is I wanted to at least touch upon sugar and cancer. Again, this would be a whole talk in and of itself. But I would argue that there is a link with sugar and cancer. And if we look at Otto Heinrich Warburg, in, um, he won the Nobel Prize in 1931, he passed away in 1970. And he won it by showing that essentially the metabolism of malignant tumors relies on glucose consumption. And so it's no surprise today that when we're looking at whether a patient with cancer has metastases, right, or spread of the cancer to other parts of their body, we use uh, something called a PET scan. And this is just an example PET scan. This is a CT, uh, and this is a PET scan. And as you can see, when we're looking for metastases, the lighted up areas are much easier to see, and that's why PET scan is the preferred modality when you're looking for uh, evidence of metastases. But the way a PET scan works is the areas that stand out the most uh, are the areas that consume the most glucose. Okay? Patients are essentially given uh, a solution that has glucose in it, and that would be drawn to uh, certain areas that light up the most, and that's where we uh, sort of look for possible evidence of metastases. There is a mouse study, and three groups of mice were injected with aggressive breast tumor cells and placed on three dietary regimens with different glycemic levels. So they had a high glycemic level, a moderate, and a low. 70 days later, 
The high sugar group, they're 16 of 24 mice dead. This was just in 70 days. The normal glycemic, 8 of 24 dead. And the hypoglycemic, only 1 of 20 uh, mice dead. And, okay, so this is a mouse study, right? But what about humans? The American Institute of Cancer Research is one of the most prestigious bodies when it comes to cancer research. And this is their recommendation on sugar. Avoid sugary drinks, limit consumption of energy-dense foods. Foods and drinks that are high in refined carbs, added sugar, and fat contribute to obesity, a major risk factor for cancer. So when we think about possible mechanisms, like how would sugar increase cancer progression or development? Um, Increased sugar and refined flour can increase your levels of insulin and a uh, hormone called, I, called IGF-1. And cancer uh, tumor cells have receptors on their outside for insulin and IGF-1. And so it's thought that with elevated levels of these and then attaching to the receptors on tumor cells, they can lead to increased tumor cell growth and ultimately to increased cancer progression. So if we bring it all together, 184,000. This is the amount of people that um, is estimated to die every year in, in the U.S. just from added sugar. Uh, and they broke it down, this was based on a 2010 global uh, burden of disease report. And they broke it down into 133,000 from diabetes, 45,000 from cardiovascular disease, and 6,450 6, from cancer. All right, so that's the data. Now, it would be one thing if sugar caused these things, but it was just something that we could take it or leave it. And if, if we now know that it's harmful, then we're just like, oh, well, then we're just going to stop eating that. But there's a problem. And this is what I call the ugly part. There's arguments that sugar is basically like a drug and that it, it, it's even as addictive as cocaine. <laughs> um, there is a study of rats that actually chose water sweetened with either sucrose or saccharin over IV cocaine. And what's interesting is that even rats who had been given IV cocaine beforehand, so, um, you know, it wasn't just choosing it with naive to both, they had already been given cocaine, so they had already developed an addiction to cocaine. They would still choose the sugar sweetened uh, water over the intravenous cocaine. And their uh, conclusion at the end of this study was that intense sweetness can surpass cocaine reward even in drug sensitized and addicted individuals. And so, the, I mean, that sounds crazy. Like, how is that even possible? But what we're finding is that when you look at addictive behavior, so whether we're talking about smoking and nicotine, um, or whether we're talking about alcohol, right? Uh, it's, alcohol is the most commonly used addictive substance in the U.S. One in 12 adults suffer from alcohol abuse or dependence. So whether smoking, alcohol, or drugs, they all follow a similar pathway. And this reward pathway is basically this connection between the ventral, this area of your brain, right, the center of your brain, called the ventral tegmental area and the nucleus accumbens. And uh, essentially what's happening is that these substances are stimulating this area of your brain, which lights up and releases huge amounts of dopamine. Okay? And that dopamine it produces the, that sort of, the sort of euphoric feeling. Well, when they looked at sugar, it turns out that this stimulates the exact same reward pathway that cocaine, that alcohol, and that nicotine all share. Um, this was a, a, another, another study done on rats where um, they fed them Oreo cookies. And they, these, these rats had significantly a greater activity uh, in the pleasure center, so that, that ventral tegmental area and nucleus accumbens than um, those even injected with cocaine or morphine. Now again, if we're looking at rats, not just rats, but humans, um, in brain scans performed on humans, people who eat sugar, this exact same region of the brain lights up, right? As, um, as lights up when people are given cocaine. And 
the natural question is, well, why do we have this? I mean, if it's so harmful, why, why should we get these euphoric feelings and uh, uh, dopamine rushes when we have sugar? Well, I mean, if you take it back to Paleolithic days, right? Um, it makes sense from an evolutionary perspective. If, I mean, when you came across fruit that was highly prized, and you would want it to release dopamine because you, in order to survive, you need to get a food supply. And so you want it to stimulate dopamine and for you to continue to seek after uh, things that are fruit-like. But our regulatory mechanisms were not intended for this kind of environment, okay, where we have fast-food McDonald's, Taco Bell on every corner, um, where we're walking down the supermarket aisle there's every possible candy that you can imagine. Um, I went to the Sonoma County Fair recently, just this past summer, and I was in disbelief. You won't be able to see it that well, but I took a picture. So this says, home of the Krispy Kreme Burger. So a burger's not enough. They took a burger patty and then they wrapped it instead of in two buns, they had two Krispy Kreme donuts. <laughs> From an evolutionary perspective, this was not <laughs> And then after your Krispy Kreme burger, again at the Sonoma County Fair, you would, could finish it off with dessert with a deep fried Oreo, or deep fried Snickers, or marshmallow pops. Lots of options. And so it's no wonder, right? It's no wonder as a result of this that we have uh, this sort of evolution. And I, I, I will never get over this number. Two thirds, two thirds of all Americans are overweight or obese. Two thirds, two out of every three people. I mean, we're going to talk about one out of every three U.S. adults metabolic syndrome. Two out of every three uh, U.S. adults overweight or obese. When we look at a sort of addiction from how we would define it in, in medical terms, we look at a number of things. First, we look at physiologic. And that's um, defined by symptoms of tolerance or withdrawal. So tolerance, right, is get, let's say you get a certain high from, you know, 10 grams of sugar. Well, over time, by developing tolerance, that 10 grams of sugar is not going to give you the same sort of joy and pleasure. And so you need higher and higher and higher amounts in order to achieve that exact same level of satisfaction. And then on the flip side, if over time you stay at 10 grams, then your level of joy would go, or happiness would go down. So that's why you kind of keep seeking after more and more. And then in terms of withdrawal, if you just remove it from somebody, then they go through uh, withdrawal, and that's usually characterized by like tremors, or anxiety, or depression, um, sweating, all sorts of physiologic signs. Addiction is also looked at in terms of aberrant or abnormal behavior. So when we think of binging, right, binging means eating excessive amounts in a single period of time. Craving, seeking, so thinking about the substance, whether it's smoking or alcohol, thinking about it even when you're not around it, right? It consumes your thoughts throughout the day. Uh, and you would go to extreme lengths to get to obtain it. And then last is the difficulty cutting back. So even when you've sort of made up your mind, like, okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna do this, I'm gonna quit whatever substance it is, you oftentimes fail. So as an example, right, tobacco, the average amount of time that it takes for an American to quit smoking is five to seven times. So they clearly have a lot of difficulty um, quitting the habit. And what we see is that with sugar, it meets all of these uh, criteria that you see evidence of uh, people needing more and more. Like think, just think of the total growth, right? or the um, sprites, you need increasing, increasing amounts to obtain the same level of satisfaction. And if you don't get it, then you actually do develop uh, symptoms of withdrawal. Uh, eating excessive amounts, binging, thinking about it all the time. Uh, and uh, I've worked with a lot of patients trying to get them to actually give it up. And they might do it for a few days, but eventually when stressful circumstances hit, or they hit a rough period, they will, their go-to will be to go to sugar. And when we think about it, if you look at this, right, this is the
the cocoa leaf. So people who people in South America, um, for example, have been chewing cocoa leaves for 8,000 years, and they don't show any signs, evidence of addiction by chewing cocoa leaves. But when you take those cocoa leaves and process it into this highly refined process form, you get cocaine. And now you've just completely changed the nature of the beast, and you, uh, you have now created something very addictive. And so on a similar note, sugar cane, right? I have chewed on sugar cane, and you have to work really hard to just get like a little, a little bit, right? For those of you who have tried sugar cane. But you take sugar cane, you do the exact same thing as you do with coca leaves, you highly process it, refine it, and then now you've created a substance that is potentially addictive for some people. And so you really, this is not true for everyone, okay? But for certain people, you can think of sugar on this same sort of addictive level as drug use, alcohol, uh, smoking. Now, <clears throat> this gets uglier. Because where there's addiction, there's a lot of money to be made. And industry clearly takes advantage of this, right? So just last month, just last month, I'm sure many of you saw this. This article came out. Um, Sugar Industry and Coronary Heart Disease Research. Again, uh, produced by a researcher at UCSF. So UCSF is, uh, is producing some good stuff. Um, and it was followed up by a New York Times article, How the Sugar Industry Shifted Blame to Fat. Essentially what they've discovered is that the sugar industry as far back as the 60s, was paying researchers to produce research that showed that our coronary artery disease epidemic was due to fat and not sugar. And so what they did is they, deflect, they deflected all the attention off of sugar and we became obsessed with fat. And what do you know? That was right around, you know, after uh, Articles were published in journals such as the New England Journal of Medicine. The 80s and 90s, we had that whole fat-free craze. That was exactly what the sugar industry wanted. You know, I, I, when you saw those products I was eating, I was playing right into their hands. And it's reminiscent, just last year, Coke, um, it was found that Coke was doing something similar. They spent millions funding researchers under this umbrella organization called the Global Energy Balance Network. It sounds, sounds pretty, I mean, if you didn't know any better, it sounds very prestigious. Global Energy Balance Network. Um, but their, their whole effort and all the money they spent was to downplay the link between sugary drinks and obesity and diabetes. And instead focus on increasing physical activity. Right? So again, they deflected all the attention off of sugar sweet beverages. What we really need to do to counter this obesity and diabetes epidemic we just got to get up and move more and exercise more. So it gets ugly because when you've got addictive behavior uh, and you've got industry conspiring to take advantage of this because there's so much money to be made, then you kind of think maybe your one hope is government regulation. Right? Your government can step in and, and, and save the day. But yet, yeah, where what we find is in terms of government subsidies, 63% of, of government subsidies go towards meat and dairy, 15% to sugar, starch, oil, and alcohol. And look at this, less than 1% of government subsidies go towards fruits and vegetables. And so when we look, this came out in the New York Times 2009, look at the relative increase in price since 1978 of fresh fruits and fresh vegetables. And then compare that, right? It's clearly steadily increased over time. And compare that with the areas that are heavily subsidized. And look at this, beer, butter, and sodas. It's gotten relatively cheaper to produce, uh, to, to produce and to, to consume. So this brings me to the last portion of the challenge of the time. Okay, great. Just going to bring me to the last portion. Um, clearly sugar is, although it has some virtues, it is a health hazard beyond just gaining excess weight. 
um, and it has addictive properties. So what are we going to do? How are we going to uh, get around this? Well, here's just a few things. We could, again, uh, this could be a whole other lecture. But at a minimum, we should try and stay under recommended limits, okay? Just keep this in mind. And this is from the American Heart Association. This is already pretty liberal, but at a minimum, we should stay under this. And what they've recommended is that for men, uh, no more than nine teaspoons, 36 grams, or the equivalent of 150 calories. And for women, six teaspoons, 24 grams, or 100 calories. Now, that is basically one can of soda. So they're saying that eat the equivalent of less than one can of soda of sugar. A can of Coca-Cola has 39 grams of sugar, which is, um, for, for men, just over 36 grams. But as you can see, for women, that would already exceed their daily allowance. Uh, just to give you an idea of what that might look like, so if someone had a large soda, uh, a, ma a man would exceed his daily allowance in, uh, by 168%, and a woman by 253%. A, bag of, a pack of Skittles, right, in one sitting then would already exceed their uh, allowance. 104%, 156%. Uh, and then this one's massive, Gatorade, right? Because um, a lot of times I see people uh, drinking Gatorade because they think it's a sports performance drink and, and therefore has health properties. Um, 132 ounce Gatorade, 155%, 233% of, you, of what the American Heart Association would recommend. So try to stay at least at a minimum under that. Um, it's amazing how many people try to justify added sugar consumption by referring to natural sources. Well, this is a dog, uh, or this is raw organic honey that I got directly from the beehive and, you know, and put, put it into my mouth. Um, so it's, you know, at the end of the day, I want you to think of them all as added sugar. Raw honey, agave nectar, maple syrup. And I'm just talking about something that I've gotten a lot of questions. What about you know organic maple syrup, um, coconut sugar? So don't don't be fooled and don't sort of kid yourself into thinking that these forms of sugar are are somehow more okay. Don't look to sugar substitutes as the answer. Um, they. When we look at things like sweet, low, and equal, these sugar substitutes can paradoxically foster overeating. They're associated with uh, obesity. And when they've done, you know, I think everyone thought that by having diet sodas, you could drink as much as you want. But sure enough, when they've done studies comparing people who drink diet drinks to uh, regular sodas, they actually can increase even more uh, in terms of weight. So don't use those and uh, justify them. Idea that you're not getting any calories and therefore it's fine. I do get uh, asked a lot about stevia. It's possibly the best substitute, all right, but caution is advised. So here's the deal with stevia it's 200 to 300 times sweeter than table sugar, and it's been used for centuries in South America and Asia. It potentially has certain anti hypertensive, anti diabetic properties, but it's not approved by, uh, by the FDA. And the biggest problem is that it is still super, super, super sweet. And so it's not doing anything to address kind of that same craving, right? It's actually just perpetuating it. Um, so I, I, would, I would advise caution. Next, you really want to watch for hidden sources of sugar. Um, so the classic ones are yogurt, right? Um, this one's the obvious one, uh, uh, fruit loops. But cereals, even like a Quaker Oats granola, which sounds wholesome and healthy, it's just loaded with sugar. Um, I think in 2017 or 2018, finally, the, the nutrition labels are going to start actually putting added sugar, which is going to be great. So, you know, right now, all nutrition labels just say total grams of sugar. So you don't know how much was um, uh, sort of inherent or natural in the food versus how much was added. Uh, but they are going to start doing that, which would be a huge, a huge bonus. So cereals is another place that it's hidden. Granola bars. This is probably, and when I put granola bars up there, I'm referring to all these energy bars. I remember I used to eat Cliff bars, um, thinking again, like, you know, there's a picture of a rock climber. <laughs> just like, oh, this is, this is a good source of energy. Uh, and I mean, I almost look like a, at a Cliff bar now, it's like a Snickers bar. It's just kind of deceptive. 
Um, so the, the whole health industry is just loaded with all these power packs, you know, sports bars, granola bars, this, that, but many of them are just loaded with sugar. And then things like the, the sauces, that's another huge area. So ketchup, barbecue sauce, um, sweet and sour sauce that you might get at a Chinese restaurant. Like all of these, just because it doesn't have the label when you get it, you know, out of a container or in your food, uh, does not mean that it is safe. It's actually very loaded with added sugar. I also wanted to caution against highly processed foods. I'm just going to give a loaf of white bread as an example. They may not add any sugar to a loaf of white bread, but because they've essentially stripped all the fiber uh, out of it, um, the white flour is essentially almost acting like added sugar. So when it, whether it's white bread or whether it's crackers, um, just these highly processed items, you really have to watch out for. This is one of the most fascinating, okay? Even certain whole, right? Whole, unprocessed, plant-based foods can be eaten excessively. So, um, I've had a lot of people who are really adherent to a whole food plant-based diet, and what they turn to is dried fruit. Because dried fruit, we would all agree, is whole food, right? It's just been dried, and it's plant-based. But what you've done is you have increase what's called the caloric density by a huge amount, all right, basically looking at the calories per, per unit of weight. By taking out the water, you increase the calories a huge amount, and these are much, much sweeter. So um, I voice a little nervous when people are putting on lots of dried fruit or dates, right? Dates is sort of like the most famous vegan, I think, like most famous sort of date bars and date everything. Um, but again, it's in moderation, it's one thing, but when you're starting to notice that you're eating eight date bars, it, it, even if it's whole fruit plant-based, there's an issue there. Okay. What about the date fruit? The date fruit, that's much better. Yes, because there you're getting a lot more fiber, it's a lot more effort <laughs> to chew. Yeah. Right. But there's that excess um, characteristic I haven't seen it so much with the date fruit, um, but I think, I mean, I guess it's possible, but I haven't really come across that. Um, and then kind of closing out, you need to determine whether you have uh, food addiction to sugar, whether this is an issue for you, right? Because as I said, there are virtues of sugar. Um, I put sugar on some of my foods, but what the key is when I have some form of sugar in with, say, my pancakes, it doesn't make me crave more after I'm done with it. Um, and so I wanted to uh, show this quiz that um, comes out of the work of uh, researcher Susan Pierce Thompson, uh, and she has this program called Bright Mind Eating. Um, and she has this kind of really short quiz that is just kind of, it gives you an idea for whether is food really a, an issue for you. And so I'm just going to walk you through the, the questions. So, she starts off, think back to a three-month stretch of time in your life when your eating was at its worst. And uh, answer these questions about how your eating was during that period. So my ability to control how much I ate is never really altered. I stopped eating when I was full, or it was practically non-existent. And once I started eating, I felt powerless to stop. And basically, your ability to control your intake. After eating a moderate amount of food, I nearly always felt satisfied. I practically never felt satisfied. My cravings for specific foods were infrequent and quite mild if I had them at all, or were frequent, powerful, and drove me to go to great lengths to satisfy them. The amount of time and energy consumed by thoughts of food, my weight, and what I had or hadn't eaten was small. I didn't think about these topics much. It was overwhelming. I thought of practically nothing else. And then last, in terms of binges, consuming huge amounts of food while feeling out of control and powerless to stop, I may have overeaten occasionally, but I never binged, or I experienced frequent severe binges. And at the end of it, you know, when you fill this out, you get a number from 1 to 10. So just that, you know, as an example, I put 3, 3, 3, 3, 3, 3, and it came out with a, a susceptibility, a food susceptibility score of 7, a 10 being the highest and 1 being the lowest. Uh, 
Um, and so if, let's just say you did something like this and you came out with a 8, 9, and 10. Then you really do need, in your case, because you saw those questions, right? Getting at things like craving, binging, um, obsessing, difficulty controlling intake. If you're scoring high on, on um, a quiz just similar to that, then you really do need to think of sugar in this vein. Nicotine, drug use, alcohol use, okay? And um, if you're scoring very low, on the other hand, then you've sort of demonstrated that you probably can have sugar in its natural, rightful place without, you know, suffering a lot of the ill effects that we discussed earlier. And I would argue that if you are falling in this camp of highly addicted to sugar, then in your case, in some cases, right, moderation is not an option. Dr. McDougall is, uh, is famous for saying moderation is not an option, and usually he's referring to animal foods or uh, dairy, like moderation is not an option, you need to cut it completely out. But I think it applies here in the case of sugar for certain people. Um, and everybody's different, so that's just something that you need to ask yourself and be honest uh, with yourself about. So just to wrap up, added sugar is the problem. I really want to emphasize this. Don't confuse it with uh, the sugar that's na that comes naturally in fruits um, and uh, vegetables. Sugar does have certain virtues, right? Makes, makes uh, eating more pleasurable. It can be life-saving for, for diabetics. It can be an important tool in extended uh, sports. But, as we've seen in excess, right? These virtues are far outweighed by the harms to one's health, whether it's metabolic syndrome, uh, inflammation, uh, or uh, even possibly cancer. And it can be highly addictive, uh, and, and cutting down in many people's case is not easy. Uh, and you need to be realistic about that. If you can't stay, I, I think a good sort of barometer is if you can't stay under the American Heart Association, Guidelines. Just for you know one to two weeks, just start measuring how much sugar you're consuming. Uh, you know, look at the labels and add it up. If you're exceeding the American Heart Association as a, as a simple start, then it might be worth trying to cut it out completely for a period of time and to see how you do. And that's it. Thank you very much.
Uh, but again, uh, the problem is repeat. Sorry about that. No problem. Um, the problem is for people who fall high on that sort of susceptibility scale, right? And there, by using things like xylitol, you're still the, the same sort of cravings and seeking behavior and uh, addictive behavior uh, will still continue. I will take one more. Um, so the question is, you know, on the one hand, I say that we should try and get under the AHA guidelines, American Heart Association guidelines, right? Nine teaspoons for men, six teaspoons for women. And then at the same time, I talk about how how huge your cravings are going to be. Well, I remember doing residency um, when we had uh, people who um, came in completely inebriated um, and uh, clearly had alcohol dependence. Their absolute worst few days was that first week of what's called detox, right? They would go to detox facilities. Um, so I would, I, what I would do is I would prep that person with that sugar issue. I say, you're going to be absolutely miserable the first, you know, one to two weeks. But if you can get over that initial hump, each day will get easier. But you're going to be, you're going to have headaches, you're going to you know, uh, feel anxious, you know, you're going to go through all sorts of stuff. Uh, uh, similar to caffeine, right? Someone who's drinking three, four cups of caffeine and it stops. Um, so I think if you calibrate your expectations accordingly, but trust that three, four months later, if you really stuck with it, that was same pretty much, much, much the best. All right, thank you so much.